Kia ora. Welcome to the Aotearoa Rugby Pod once again. It's quarter-final time. We've been waiting 15 weeks for this, but we're finally here. At the very start, we mentioned who our top eight would be. We might have to revisit that a little bit uh, along the way, Jippa. But look, a lot to come. The big game of the weekend coming up, probably the Hurricanes in Canberra. That's the real 50-50 match out of them. We'll have a look at that and how the Hurricanes win over the Crusaders left them in good stead to maybe go over there and pick up a win. We'll go through a few curly viewer questions today. You guys have sent in some, some interesting ones. And also Aaron Smith. He says goodbye to the Highlanders, obviously one of the all-time greats. We have a look at what he means to that club and what it looks like for that club in the future without him in their ranks. So, but without further ado, James Parsons in the studio. Psyched up for the Blues. Yep. Got a home playoff and it's ready Those to go. Those are my eight teams too. Yep. Yep, I was just, just the wrong order. Wrong order, wrong but, order but you, know, you knew. Got the right eight. But you left Joey's Highlanders out of that top eight, and and probably awfully <laughs> clever of him to do that, Joe Wheeler. Welcome to the podcast. It really pisses me off, um, Jip, to hear that. He didn't pick my Highlanders. You are certainly off the Christmas card list, the whole day. Bloody hell. He invited me on this show, and I find out that the co host hasn't picked my team. <laughs> A ridiculous. Oh, I just can't believe it. Ross, can we hang out now? Or what? <laughs> well, if you can stick around for another 45 minutes at least, uh, we'd appreciate it. But feel free to come at him hard. Like, that's your prerogative. Oh, mate, yeah, no, look, um, those teams certainly deserve to be there in the Highlanders' day. They just, they weren't good enough, plain and simple this year. Um, yeah, good look in the mirror from those boys because, yeah, they just fell short on too many occasions in a couple of crucial games, especially in Australia. They need to win. Couldn't deliver when the, when the, uh, push came to shove. So, yeah, disappointing year. I'm sure they'll be sulking into their points, uh, points today as we speak. There's a personification of spades. I'm surprised he didn't mention yeah, the word I know. at any stage. Good on you, mate. I probably should, but I, I won't. Um, but, yeah, I'm sure they're having a couple. I'm not sure what they're celebrating other than probably uh, the departing lads, like you said at the top, Aaron Smith leaving, um, a couple of others, Marino McKayley too, Shannon Frizzell, a couple of really... Um, some Hollanders that have been around for a, a long time as well. So I'm sure they're enjoying each other's company for one last time. Um, but yeah, it wouldn't be tasting as good as what a, what a Spates normally does, mate, that's for sure. <laughs> does a Spates taste good? <laughs> I don't know about that. I don't know. Call me a Jaffa. Uh, <laughs> I'm not buying it. You uh, certainly are, mate. You certainly are. Not fruity enough for you. Not fruity enough. <laughs> <laughs> something a bit more hoppy um, for me. Uh, <laughs> before we get into the plight of the Highlanders, let's go positive, shall we? Aaron Smith. Quite innings. Yeah, oh, I, I think it just shows the measure of him as a player, how much respect was shown at Eden Park. You know, like last game there, not getting an All Blacks test, obviously, later in the year. So um, he's had a massive impact on the game and, and I'm sure inspired a lot of um, you know future nines that maybe would have deemed themselves a little bit too small for rugby um, into the game and, and, and contributed a hell of a lot for, for now and into the future. Mm. That's suppose what he's done on the field, Joey. We don't necessarily see what... He's contributed at the Highlanders off it. You've been there, you've won a title with him. What does Aaron Smith bring to a team away from the field? The thing about Nug, he wears his harmlessly. We see that on the field, but he's he's exactly the same away from that. And sometimes that can um, be a little bit frustrating in those senior player environments because he's questioning everything. He's sometimes overanalyzing um, certain things, but he's doing it for the betterment of the team. He's a uh, an ultra competitive man, um, like most halfbacks are, but I think he is a guy that takes that to a whole other level. Um, the way he prepares, it is no um, mistake or no fluke that he has played 185 games for this club and of those 185 games, other than I think he probably had, his worst season would have been 2013 alongside a lot of other All Blacks, but he has hardly ever put a foot wrong. He has always been one of the best players on the field, one of the most consistent players. And I mean, not only for the Hollanders, but I mean, in terms of that whole competition. For me, he'd arguably be one of the most influential um, rugby players that we've seen play Super Rugby. Um, I know for the Highlanders how influential he's been on the field, but also off it. the way he prepares his body, um, ultimate professional. He's always in that gym before everyone, um, whether it's working on his passing. That's one thing that always staggered me about Aaron Smith um, is when he was a young man, he always worked on his passing. That was going to be his point of difference. And that hasn't stopped to this day. He is still 
got the best pass in the world, and that's because he 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 that's as part of his game that he's always going to be um, his point of difference, his speed and and the speed of pass. Um, is, is what sets him apart, and that's why he's world class. And he's seen off some of the and on kept at bay and kept that starting nine jersey for the All Blacks for such a long time, um, and probably changed the game. Like you think back to when he came into the All Blacks frame before that, Pity Wepu, Jimmy Cowan, um, that sort of bigger frame halfback, maybe considered a fourth loose forward, were the guys that they went to. And then Aaron Smith in 2012 came on the scene and and Man, did he um, set the world alight with his with his speed across the ground and his speed of pass, and that hasn't been matched um, for sometimes some of the guys that have been chasing him. You think TJ Perinata, um, Tawita Kurt Barlow, Andy Ellis, Brent Weber, Triple T, uh, Finlay Christie. No one's been able to knock him off his perch. So, yeah, he's world class, um, and everything is due from preparation right through to performance. So, yeah, one of the best that I think we'll ever see um, throw, the, throw the nine jersey on, not only for the All Blacks, but definitely for the Highlanders. When you've got that speed and width of pass, how does that affect the way that the opposition's going to take you on? Oh, it just doesn't give them time to take you on, to be honest, because his pass can almost take out five or six def- defenders at once. You know, around that breakdown, you know, if they're too tight together, one of his bullet pass to a midfielder promoting themselves, just even if they don't make it um, through that D line or advantage line, they've still trapped and those guys aren't going to get round quick enough for someone like him who can almost get it popped or keep it going and time and time again, especially I suppose when Ben Smith was there, they, they just had this knack of doing exactly that and it was purely his ability to get that speed of ball um, out of the breakdown and of course obviously guys like Joey cleaning those rucks so that's, you know, <laughs> pinpoint uh, for his service. <laughs> Uh, There's one thing I will say about Aaron Smith is when you put your hand up or, or your hand out and you wanted to pass, it was on a platter. Like that, he very rarely, you were very rarely having to catch it up here or down at your ankles. It was in front of you. And for guys, we never had the biggest pack, um, but we were the quickest around the field and we played with speed and that was always our point of difference. And he was the one that drove that. And if we weren't in position quick enough, uh, we knew about it. Uh, that was one of Aaron's um, great great strengths as well as keeping guys accountable. But uh, man, was it a pleasure to catch his passes? I'll tell you what, um, yeah, world class and, and always on the button. One of the things about him that seems to stand out, and I don't know whether this is real or this is just my imagination, but I don't remember halfbacks having relationships with wingers the way that he had relationships with wingers. Like when I think, Joey, of Aaron Smith and Waisaki Naholo and how often, or Aaron Smith and, and Ben Smith, and how often he would be going directly to them. And I don't feel like you saw a lot of halfbacks doing that before him. No, I think you're right. And I think it's the benefit of, like, Ben and Ben and Aaron playing so much rugby together for such a long time is that they know they can read each other's body language when they're heading into things, or um, they just need to hear one one little um, cue and they're picking up exactly what that other guy is saying. And th- those guys had a real knack um, throughout, probably from 2014 through to 2017. I think that's when the Islanders played their most consistent and best rugby, and it was by no mistake that. Um, the Smiths and Waisaki were, were a huge part of that. And you're right, but I think Jamie Joseph also um, made sure that the Fijian boys, Waisaki and, and Paddy Osborne, were always bringing something to the party, as he used to call it. Get around the rucks and pick off some of those fatties like James Parsons. <laughs> fatties no longer, Joey. <laughs> I'm not sure if you've seen his Instagram. Yeah. I'm not sure if you've seen his Instagram, well, Joey, I'm but not, there's, there's not an ounce of fat. about that for a second? Yeah, oh, please, please do. Are you, it's, are you it's, looking to become a male model or something? Like, are you reinventing yourself or what? Oh well, you know, you got to do what you got to do. You got to make money while the while the sun shines. Yeah, going. real estate agent, real estate agent, male model, fitness. It's, oh. Oh, you got it all, mate. Yeah, yeah, and <laughs> and my head's getting bigger as you speak. <laughs> Yeah. I would have had a field day with that back in the day with if you're in the team environment. That would have just been everywhere. That would have oh, been everywhere. And there's no doubt there's there's no doubt it wouldn't have gone up in the team environment. <laughs> Did it get brought up when you went and when you went and named the Blues team today? Hopefully they introduced nah. it as you um, with your shirt off running into it. No, nah, I don't know how uh, you get uh, greeted at the Highlanders, mate, but it was it was all pleasantries for me. <laughs> 
Hope you wore the heat gear, mate. Just for old time's sake. Before we move on to what we're looking at for the quarterfinals to come, the Highlanders, we have had an email through from David Lawrence via email. He says, I'm a Highlander supporter. This year, we look dreadful. Next year, Aaron Smith will be gone. In the meantime, Drew are getting better and even the force are showing signs. Is it possible that the Highlanders could finish bottom of the table next year? What do you think, Chip? Of the whole? Of the whole thing. No. No, no. I, I don't think so. Um, I mean, Joey's probably um, very well placed to comment on this in terms of the players coming through. But if you look at a guy like Sean Withy uh, as an example, I reckon you know, he's a player that has got a, you know, a massive future. Um, you know, Billy Harmon, I, I don't know. Th those sorts of players have been... It hasn't been an easy year with injuries um, for the Highlanders. It's not as straightforward as probably people think in terms of skill set. Mm. Um, but, I mean, you're always going to be in the contest if, you, if you've got that talent around the breakdown. Uh, we know they've got the ability when, when fit at set piece as well. Ethan De Groot, man, he's playing some of his best rugby and as I like to say, it's one up front. Um, <laughs> there's some key men that can, can deliver that for them. Mm. Well, what's your take on it, Joey? Oh, look, I can understand his frustrations, um, but I don't, I, yeah, I don't think that they'll finish bottom of the heap. Uh, I definitely think that the Islanders are going to be rebuilding. Um, I hate to use that um, that phrase, but that's essentially what they need to do. And they've finally realised that they need to invest in um, developing their um, out of their own region, or sorry, not out of their own region, but recruiting earlier and developing those players in, in the region. They haven't done that in the past, um, but they put some investment in that started about three years ago, and they will soon see the fruits of that. If they can um, hold on to their young talent, um, then I think they're going to be in really good stead for the future because they've got some really good young young men coming through that program. I look at AJ Faliafana, who's going to make hopefully make the New Zealand 20s this year. Cam Miller was part of the New Zealand 20s side last year. So two really good young 10s coming through the system. Finn Hilly, um, a good young 15 that will hopefully make the uh, New Zealand 20s this year. He made the team last year. Um, if they can keep those guys, because what's glaringly obvious is obviously Mitch Hunt had a disappointing season this year. They just haven't been able to, since Lima Sopwanga and Ben Smith, they haven't been able to find a consistent combination at that 9, 10, 15, the real spine and the drivers of, of that Islander side. And that's the glaringly obvious um, part that they're missing, I believe. Um, the rest, if they can all stay fit and available, I think um, they, they'll be able to put together a reasonable 15. So with all of that said, I'm imagining the answer to this next question is no, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Jimmy Kipp from YouTube, thank you very much for coming to us. Uh, he says, with their relative populations and the changes in population over the next 30 years that Super Rugby has, is it right that Otago still has a Super Rugby franchise, but Bay of Plenty does not? Jeez, dang it. Dang it. It's a pick on the whole today, isn't it? It is. Oh, look, Jimmy, um, I think... And, you know, I'm a real stickler for population bases in, in this country. And my understanding is the Bay of Plenty region itself uh, is the population base is about 350,000. Otago region and the southern region the number line is about the same. Uh, so I, I think you've got a fair argument in terms of population growth. I know where I'd rather live, um, would it be the Mount or... <laughs> well, um, well, Man, that on the out, that's so. Oh, uh, you know, you get the you can get the spades budgie smugglers on any time of the year out there, but not so much down here. Um, but no, I, I don't agree. I, I think uh, the, his best chance of having a Super Rugby franchise is trying to get the Chiefs to be based in Tauranga rather than Hamilton, because I know where I'd rather live. Let's move I, on to the uh, Hurricanes and the Crusaders. Because God, that was a good game. Oh, it was a goodie. The Hurricanes sounded a warning, really, before the playoffs. Down 19-3, they had to show the kind of guts that will get you a win in Canberra. Yeah, uh, well, I think, and um, give them the belief they can do it. I think you just need to look at the way Dane Coles played um, to, to show what it means, um, that, that jersey. And, you know, he was, he was backed up by, by a number, but him in particular, Set the, set the tone for them to make that comeback. <laughs> he loved it. Yeah. I, I know it was his last game. I don't know how sentimental Coles he is, but he is passionate, that's for sure. Um, and we saw it, Joey. 
Oh, I, I, and he kept on off here. Uh, and he was like, there was no way I was losing to that Crusader team uh, on my last game on, on, on Sky Stadium. And, and then oh, he just played with his heart on his sleeve. He was absolutely his, in his niggliest best. And I actually think well, he was the catalyst. What he did, like, he... They were obviously got smacked on the nose early, and the and the Crusaders just kept coming through the front door as they always do. That's where they go to when they're in doubt. They go to their forwards. They'll muscle you up, and they were doing it brilliantly. Then Colsey said, "No, nah, not on my turf." And uh, in that second half, just was like, "Right, I'm going to get under these guys' skin," and he did a perfect job. Like so un crusader like to throw them off the game like that, and especially a guy like um, Cody Taylor, who is normally unflappable. A uh, real cool, calm customer, great leader. He was rattled. He got in the red. You could see the rest of them. They were all flying in from everywhere, all the Crusaders. But that lifted that crowd. They all got in behind him, 18,000. I've never seen for every little bit of niggle that was going on. They were on their feet. Flags were going nuts. It was it was something to behold, and that lifted the rest of the team. So, yeah, Colsey was just – it was like – I'm just going to do this because, you know, whether it's the last um, hurrah or whatever, if I get sighted, I'll get sighted. Oh, hey, he was just at his absolute niggliest best and pushed it right to the limit. Um, but, yeah, some of those images, especially when Cody Taylor got simmed, but he's given it this. <laughs> oh, first of all, this, it was far out. There was a hilarious moment in, in rugby history. I just thought, this is so good. Iconic. Like, that's iconic, Colsey. Yeah, it's so good. <laughs> You've had your time with Colsey. Yeah, yeah, not quite like that. Uh, we always said a few things, but that was um, that was definitely another level, especially because they are great mates. Um, but it, it definitely shows you when you cross that white line, there's no friends. Um, I almost thought they subbed him a little early, um, but I think probably they were maybe worried that if he keeps going the way he's going, he <laughs> might get yellow carded too. So they needed to get the, the young fella Devery on, um, who, who did a great job when he came on. But I just thought... That he, you know, I mean, the way he was even, I don't know if you, because you were down there, Joe, he was just storming that sideline. You know, you couldn't always see it. Oh, yeah. It was oh, man, he, on was, the field. he was dialed right on. Like, he was right on, like, into the assistant referees about things. And oh, it was just so good to watch. I was just, I was basically following him the whole game. But I actually think one part of the game that they, Max or actually betted the Crusaders was that scrum time. I thought their scrum was exceptional. And and obviously we know how good a scrummage at Coles he is. I don't think he gets enough audits for that work he does in that in that area. But they were they they I think the Crusaders were a little bit rattled by that because that's usually, as you know, Joe, it's their mall, it's their line out, their scrum, their mall that they go to when they want to either get a penalty out of a team or they want to um, basically frustrate teams into mistakes. And they just couldn't do that at scrum time. And I think Colsey, he was he was dictating terms which would frustrate the Crusaders, let's put it that way, that, that they were that they were allowed to do that. I, I think the expectation would be that the Hurricanes should have, you know, like they're down so many props to Crusaders. And, you know, like we've just spoken about the Highlanders and the injury toll. To get, like, and I know I'm going off the Canes um, track here, but... For the Crusaders to get second place, like for the amount of injuries I've had up front, <laughs> as we all know, it's, it's one up front, is so impressive. And they were still in that game right to the end. Just to go on to Colsey again, what is a good scrummaging hooker? Like, how do you tell the difference? Oh, it, like a hooker normally runs the cutter at scrum time. They, they make a lot of the plans um, out in the middle. Um, and I suppose it's just making that execution um, and manipulation of the opposite front row to get up your side. You know, if you're in the corner, you always want to promote your flankers if you're on defence and an attack, so it slows it down. Um, and also, you know, a lot of the time in those midfield scrums is keeping it square and steady. And a lot of the pressure will, a lot of tight heads like to get in on the hooker, so um, keeping tight heads out um, is, a, is a big factor. But it's almost like, it's kind of hard to explain if, if you know what I mean, like as Crono always said, the best coaches are actually when you get three on three and, and players talking to players because it is um, quite a unique, it's a feel and, and you've got to have a, a good feel for, um, you know, I suppose where the pressure's coming from, what, what you need to adjust um, to get your outcome that you need. So it's kind of like being a line-out caller. You, the hooker is going to the props before you. 
you, you, you pack and you go, yeah. hey, let's let's turn slightly left this time or whatever. It might a be. little bit more straightforward than lineouts. Yeah, like lineouts are quite, um, you know, there's so much so much variation in lineouts. It's it is pretty straightforward. Um, at scrum time, but yeah, the hooker will will normally run. Uh, run the cutter there in, in terms of what side you want up if you want it square and steady and they'll connect with the half back in the first five um, because you know sometimes you want to paint the opposite picture of what you're trying to do to catch the defense off as well and that's just experience time in scrums yeah and prep during the week yeah so you would review um, and preview uh, the opposition and, and you'd go on with a plan now I want to touch on Cody Taylor's non-try there was obstruction from John Arthur now you know, we've heard a lot recently about malls and where the malls are just obstruction and whether they should or shouldn't be allowed, driving line out drives, etc. The people like Wayne Smith who aren't happy with them. I've heard Steve Hansen talk about that before. You know, it's a weird old game and there's this one area of the game where this rule kind of goes out the window for obstruction. You finish obstructing for, a, you know, 30 seconds and then you break off the side and a player has minimal impact on the people in front as Cody Taylor goes over to score the try. It is, it does feel a bit strange, doesn't it? It was pretty tough, like, I mean, there could have been a call that it changed lanes a little bit as they peeled round um, the side of that moor, but I, I, it was hard. I don't know what you thought, Joe, but I don't know where John Afar was meant to go. Mm. <laughs> he can't just yeah. disappear. <laughs> like, um, I, yeah. thought it was, I thought they were hard done by, to be honest, because it could be, partic you could think it's still the same moor, because the other players just got sheared off by the Hurricanes defense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's what I thought, mate. I, I thought it was the same mall, just because the others, you know, shore off and, and then Arfo went through, Cody was connected, disconnected, and then scored the try. Um, so, yeah, really, really, really tricky one, really, really technical um, pen penalty, but uh, I suppose by the letter of the law, probably correct. Uh, but, yeah, I, I was a bit like you, Jep. Um, probably felt that they were a little bit hard done by there. And, and the reason being is because if if John Afoa and Cody Taylor pop off and then do that, yeah. then absolutely yeah. that's obstruction. But they stayed in yeah. their position, these players get sheared off. So to me, that's the same more. They haven't left, they haven't moved. So I just don't know but there's where no he was supposed to go. Yeah, but there's no opposition player connected to it, so now it's not a mall. Yeah, but... It's still the same more. Like but, you'd, you'd see yeah. it t if Cam Roygaard's not there. Like John Afar doesn't disappear. No. So do you know what I mean? Like I, I don't know. It just for me, I thought it was a little bit hard done by. Yeah, and I just felt like this was. It was just a completely confusing weekend as far as obstruction is concerned. Like, we often see players <laughs> running in the way of different people, you know, in all sorts of scenarios where, you know, and, and that, that's, that's good rugby, you know, as long as you don't take people out. When you look at Ned Hannigan's try for the Tars versus Moana Pacifica, you know, he runs off to the right from a ruck. Hooper goes forward, takes out a bloke. I can't remember who the other person was, takes out a bloke, and then Hannigan goes over. He's had two obstructions that help him. And then the referee goes... No, neither is an obstruction. <laughs> there were two contacts, two people couldn't make tackles, and no obstruction. Like, the, the, Joey, the game has has gone mad. No, it's, it's just, yeah, yes, yeah, simply, yeah. I think it has. But that one, you know, it's so obvious to everyone other than the people that are making the call for some reason that there's two obstructions there. It's like, what? Well, I, I, yeah, I, I just. I can't understand their thought process sometimes to, to get to that decision. Do you know? Do you know what I mean, mate? Like that's the the really hard thing is the inconsistencies between that. I mean, you look at the um, Crusaders no try against the the Hurricanes. It's like, right? I, I don't know. I just you don't know where, what what to do, right? You think one would be an obvious one and one's not, um, but yeah, it just seems to be they get the calls around the wrong way. So rule nine, obstruction. <laughs> I've picked out the three parts of that rule because it's quite a long rule as to what is the most <laughs> important part. Okay, an offside player must not intentionally obstruct an opponent or interfere with play. A player must not intentionally prevent an opponent from tackling or attempting to tackle the ball carrier. And the third one that applies to both these scenarios, a ball carrier must not intentionally run into an offside teammate to obstruct the opposition, which is what they got our four for, obviously. Uh, <sighs> 
Do we need to have obstruction rules that work in every single part of the game exactly the same? So it's simple. I mean, we don't want to turn into rugby league. You know, we, we like the complexities of the game, but sometimes it's a bit daft. I think it's simple. I just think we've just got two um, situations that are pretty rare. You think how much rugby's been played this year. Um, mm. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't think it's a... Uh, a big issue in our game, personally. <laughs> there are a couple of really cool moments actually that were weird this weekend. Max Bury's try, actually, in the, <laughs> in the game between the Force and the Chiefs, where he's going to nail a 50-22. <laughs> and then he kicks the 50-22 in field and goes and scores off it. <laughs> I, I would argue, Joe, that there's possibly a chance that that has never, ever happened before in the game, ever. No, no, it was quite brilliant, wasn't it? Like, well, it was like, firstly, a brilliant kick for the 50 20 turn, and then um, the chip and chase to, to then go again. Yeah, lovely, lovely play from the young man. Good heads up. I, I don't, I, I mean, if you look at the whole weekend, you know, in terms of picks and, you know, what was expected, it was, it was definitely opposites, mm. um, you know, in terms of what we'd seen previously. Maybe the Brumbies Rebels won. Um, is the only one that sort of went the way we were expecting. But even then, the Rebels, I think they showed that the Brumbies are vulnerable. Yeah, yeah I, I think the Brumbies, um, you know, areas that they've been so good in previously, um, you know, I suppose if we use, you know, tackle percentage and their ability on defence, it, it's just not at the level. They used to be a hard side to get points against. And mm. whereas they're scoring plenty, to, to their credit, they are they're getting a lot of points, but they are letting in a lot. Um, and I think, you know, with the Canes coming this week, they, they will need to shore that up because the Canes also showed they can score a lot of points quickly. Mm. And that's 28 points a game at home, Joey. That's a lot. Matter that, that is, yeah, and, and Jim's right. Um, that stadium, when you go to Canberra, it is normally you know you're in for a real dog fight um, to come away with any points. And especially when you enter their 22, they scrap and fight for everything really, really good around there. Obviously, their set piece, um, more defence, their scrum defence is always really, really strong. So you have to work super hard to score points. So, yeah, for them to be giving away 28 is, a, is quite a staggering number. And you're right, uh, the Canes, the way they're attacking... Man, if, if they let the floodgates open and give them a sniff, they have got some of the best attacking weapons in the competition. So, yeah, the, you know, the, the top of the stats in terms of offloading, line breaks, um, defenders beaten, I reckon. So uh, the Brumbies, yeah, they need to shore it up pretty quickly and be really, really accurate. Um, especially around their kicking um, for, for that unstructured game because that's where the Hurricanes are just so, so deadly. So, yeah, it, it, it's, um, there was an interesting stat when I read that, that they were that high. I, I just wouldn't expect that from a Brumby side, especially at home, because um, traditionally, yeah, really, really tough place to, to go and, and score that amount of points. You're normally thinking that you're going to win by, um, you know, seven or under. That's, it's always going to be a tight affair. So, yeah, crazy numbers. Hurricanes as well, they're, they're leading the comp in terms of turning 22-metre entries into a try. So if you let them in there, most more than any other team in the comp, they will come away with with five, maybe seven, and and they don't look to go in the three. So uh, I mean, it could be another tough week uh, for the Brumbies at home. So where do you see the Brumbies flaky? Where is it that the the Hurricanes pinpoint? Oh look, I, I think it's not so much the Brumbies are flaky, but where the Hurricanes are so dominant at the moment is the breakdown both sides of the ball, um, the the loose forward trios that they have, and and even the guys that come off the bench are just, you know, so good at either getting turnovers, getting a penalty um, and or cleaning well past the ball to get that speed for, for guys like Cam Roy or even as we saw on the weekend, Adi Savia just picking through the middle, offload try. Um, that, that speed and that tempo around the breakdown um, will we'll need to be at that level because, you know, guys like Samu and co, um, also not too bad mm. in that area. So, but I think they've got to play to their strengths. It's not so much what the Brumbies um, aren't doing quite well. It's like, let's, as the Hurricanes, let's just keep doing what we've done well and, and look at that second half, and that's what they did. They held onto the ball, they kept territory-based um, pressure, and, and they were patient, and, and they got the rewards. Joey, Brett Cameron at 10 for the Canes. Is that the way to go with the playoffs, Brett Cameron, not Aidan Morgan? Yeah, 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 I, th I believe so. Um, Aidan did a good job. Uh, I just think Brett... Um, brings a, a tactical awareness and a tactical ability um, that's slightly better than Aiden. I, I just think his 
out of hand kicking, his decision making, and his combination with Geordie Barrett um, is what sets the team apart. I think what we saw from Brett before his um, MCL injury, he was he was um, a real uh, key cog and and the success of that Hurricane side. He was driving that team really really nicely. A real calm hit um, amongst. What we, we always know about the Hurricanes is that we've got super athletes um, across the board uh, can razzle it up from everywhere, but sometimes their, uh, their decision-making and, and crucial moments lets them down. And, and I think what we saw from Brett is really calm head, him alongside Geordie driving that team. They were making really, really sound decisions. And you just got a guy that's genuinely going to look for everyone else before himself. Um, and... He, he um, puts them in the right areas of the field first, but then his passing game is really, really accurate. So um, he'll distribute really well to all those rocket ship athletes that he's got outside him um, to, to do their razzle um, and, and let them have the freedom um, rather than thinking that um, he needs to do it himself, which sometimes Hurricanes teams in the past because they've just got super individual athletes across the board have sometimes gone a little bit too individual. So, yeah, I would stick with Brett. Um yeah, I just think he's he's that calm head that they need to to keep making their push. I think for me, they're, they're the real smoky um, uh, to go potentially go all the way. I think they'll do it in in Canberra, and that'll set them up. And obviously, they'll get a lot of confidence from what they did in the weekend uh, with their set piece functioning a lot better at the previous two weeks, especially against the Blues. I think it was. I don't even know if it got to 50%. Their line-out um, was really, really shaky. But they got better in that area against the Crusaders. Still got a couple picked off, which you sometimes expect against a, um, a Sam Whitelock lead side um, in that area of the game. But this their scrum was really, really sound. And also, um, obviously, their line-out winning that ball, if you can get um, front football with the, the, the backline that they've got and their ability to offload, and the speed that they play, like Jibba said, around the ruck, um, they're going to be a really, really tough team to contain. So, yeah, they're, they're a dangerous prospect for this final series, I reckon. The, the one thing I love about Brett Cameron is his selfless act. So if you watch him in behind forward pods, so often you'll see first fives or, or that playmaker out the back not engaged. So... If, if they're not engaged, as a defender, you can just pick those forwards off. You can get line speed, rush. But if that first five is engaged, there's a likelihood he's got to get the ball, which means you need to be thinking, OK, does he come through this seam? Does he go out the back? And time and time again, even when they're just carrying, he is always engaged out the back of that pod. And and it's like, it's it's unseen effort. Mm-hmm. But, man, it pay it. It is so key in terms of just slowing defence enough to potentially get a weak shoulder. And we're not talking making line breaks. It's about getting that two, three, four metre carry for them to get that speed and momentum in their game. And, and he is he is so critical in what he does. And then also when he gets the ball, he calls at the right time and he goes through. So, uh, you know, we've seen Richie Moana do it for um, a number of seasons at Super Rugby in and around that forward pot. And, and he's probably been the best exponent of it. Brett Cameron, obviously out of a very similar situation coming through the Canterbury age grade that you can just see that has been drilled into him from a young age and, and it is a big point of difference for me when I'm watching first receivers. All right, so always in the game. Plus, he benefits from the fact, you know, Cameron Regard is the president of the Cameron Regard fan club. <laughs> there is that option inside that defenders are held up to as well. Oh, yeah, and... You know, like Cam Roy goes a threat, but so is Duplessis Karifi, Adi Savia, you know, Braden Yossi. Like, they are just such a threat in and around the close quarter stuff at the moment with, with their skill set. And to your point on the set piece, you wouldn't have seen in the past Braden Yossi having that much time to peel off and go score a try. Just absolutely um, blitzed uh, Barrett on the side of the scrum. You know, and that all comes down to what you're talking about, a strong set piece, because you're not doing it if you're going backwards. You're exactly right, mate. Like this, uh, Scott was just so concerned about their scrum, like he was scrummaging that whole time. Like he was, he, he needed his um, right shoulder on the whole time to keep that pressure on because I was so concerned about their set piece that it gave obviously um, Brandon your say a little bit, a little bit of a head start on him. But mate, like. He, he's he's not going to be the last guy that Brandon Yorsey skins off the back of the screen. Um, he that guy is an absolute rocket ship. Like he is super fast, and we saw he got on the angle, got around him, obviously got around Scott, then palmed off um, poor old Lamb on debut, and then was too quick for the covering defence as well. So, 
Yeah, I think you, well, I think we'll see a lot more of that um, from Brady. You will say he is a superb athlete, powerful and super quick. Is that got options? I, I don't think Barrett could have done any better, to be honest. And if you look at, you think of the be, best six, you know, let's use um, Sia Khaleesi. I, I don't think he touches them either. And, and purely, it's because if if Barrett isn't engaged and on that scrum, Tyrell Lomax will milk a penalty there. Yep. They will get a penalty, yep. so he has to stay on. The other team that I worry for is the Reds, because it seemed like such a good idea to beat the Chiefs in Taranaki a few weeks ago. Now it seems like a daft idea. <laughs> you face them in 1v8 in the quarterfinals, and you've got a team that is by far the best team in the competition, and they're pissed off, and they've got a point to prove. And we could see a lot of points this weekend. Yeah, well, I'd, I think you just got to look at that team that got the opportunity against the Reds and... and fell short, still put themselves in a position to you know, win the game, but the way they were against the force, that was them saying, actually, that, that hurt us a lot. We've also wanted to get the coaches respect back. So I feel like that whole squad is just primed and ready for finals footy, like right on point. You know, like they have got a full 38-man roster to pick from and guys are you know, climbing over each other no doubt, at training to, to make, a, make a statement and get a crack in that kind of thing. You just see the front line side for the, for the Chiefs side roll out and that is going to be put, put this red side to the sword at home. Um, they'll be hurting after what happened in New Plymouth and, and I think you're going to see a reaction um, that they'll be like, right, we're going to set the tone here for, for what's going to happen in the final series. Mate, a lot of these quarters could be nasty. Yeah. Did so you, you're thinking blowouts? I just feel like a lot of the sides, like if you think about the Crusaders, they, they'll want to bounce back. The Blues didn't really nail um, them, themselves against the Highlanders, the Chiefs, the Reds. And then, I don't know, the Canes, just for me, something says they're just peaking at the right time. I don't, I don't know, there's something about them that I just think, you know, and they've led the stats in terms of the tackle year and the Brumbies defence isn't quite there. They could put a lot of points on quickly. Mm. So, this is probably going to be played in the Brumbies team talk now. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. That's what we're after. That, that just means more clicks. Yeah. Well, let's have a look at it then. The Blues versus the Tars is the first game on Friday. When we look at that game, the Tars coming off a loss against MP, not necessarily their top side. Certainly MP's first win of the year and probably a few people are a little bit surprised by that. I mean, you would expect the Blues, Joey, to, to waltz through this. Is it that simple? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, the Tars, although they made a lot of changes to that side that lost to, to um, Moana Pacifica, uh, I, I just don't think that they'll be able to come to Eden Park and, and tip up a, a highly motivated Blues team. The concerning thing to me is, uh, is for the Blues is, you're right, um, their, their performance against the Islanders was underwhelming. Um, I, I don't know... I look at their team and I'm like, yeah, you've got a good forward back, but I, I look at that back line, I just don't think they're utilising their talent as well as they can. And I think if they can get that right, that they they could be a really, really scary um, prospect for teams. But the one thing I, I um, like about the Blues this season is their defence. Like, man, you can win you can win competitions based on that, and, and it's been you know probably their biggest strength when everyone expects them to be attacked. Uh, they're the second least, they've allowed the second least amount of entries into their 22. Mm -hmm. And they've, you know, there's not a big conversion rate against them when teams go into the 22. So, man, that's one cornerstone. They just need to keep turning up for each other and doing that. But I know one area they'll want is they're also the team that has created the most opportunity but hasn't capitalised on it. So on the flip side, they've entered the 22 20, 20 25 times more than second in terms of the comp. They have, they have gone into the 22, but their conversion rate isn't as, it definitely, you know, from my time under Leon, is not as high as he'd want. He's, he's ruthless in the expectation that you're almost going to that 22, you're leaving three, five or seven. Um, so I think that the exciting thing for them is they're creating the opportunities. They're going to get the opportunities again. That what they'll, they'll need, and this is why Joey's probably feeling the way he's feeling, is they need to make it count. They need to get across that line. Um, if you use the Crusaders as an example, earlier in the year at Eden Park, you know they were camped down there, couldn't get across the line in that, and then then cost them, same against the Chiefs. So they will want to um, get that right um, because I think they'll get through the Tars personally. Um, that's no disrespect. I just think you know they're a better side and they're at home. But then they're looking at um, a semi-final down at um, 
in, in Christchurch where I, I think they've got the game capable um, to, to win down there. I think obviously getting over that 18 year hurdle last year um, you know, gives them a real good opportunity to go, go to the final again this, this season. So what aren't they doing in that 22? Uh, maybe it's a little bit like Joey said, maybe it's a little bit one dimensional. You know, like we, you, in terms of those active players, like defence will get mani manipulated if players are active and you've got those bodies in motion. Um, like uh, someone out the back of forward pods, um, you know, obviously, you know, having that winger, which I think Mark Tiller is pretty good at. He hovers around everywhere and, and comes off his wing, and, and so is Caleb. Um, so there, there's a lot they're doing well, but maybe they're just not utilising those, those players in the 22 because they have had a lot of excess... Um, you know, with the, with the big bodies up front um, when they get into 22 and just sort of bullying teams. But it hasn't been as um, often as, as the Blues would like, I think, this season in particular. Do you agree? Yeah, I think definitely Mark Salia, um we talked about bringing something to the party. He's still, still in there. <laughs> it's he's, his party. He's bringing everything he can. He is, the party. Um, he is the party. Wherever it is in the field, um, that guy is phenomenal. I, I still would like to see more from Caleb Clark. I think that's where he is at his absolute best is when he's seeing those, you know, no disrespect to the tight forwards, but the fatties in the middle of the field and, and manipulating them coming off uh, Finlay Christie's shoulder. I just think they are a little bit too one-dimensional. I think we're seeing too much of their forward runners just one off, one pass carry, one pass carry, one pass carry. I'd like to see a little bit more manipulation from them, whether that's a tip pass, um, whether that's out the back and then, and then hitting runners. Like, they just need to change the point of attack a little bit more uh, because – there's no question around their athleticism. I just don't think some of their athletes, especially I'm um, thinking the Rico Ioannis, um, the Mark Tillers, the Count of Clarks are getting the ball with the time and space. So they need to go looking for that a little bit more around the ruck. That's what I'd like to see a little bit more of. And hold the ball a little bit more on counterattack as well. Like they, I feel like they kick a lot more than what sometimes they need to. I'd like to see them just hold the ball for a few more phases and have a, have a goal, have a, have a, have a, have a nudge at the counter-attack because I just don't I don't see them um, being really, really confident in that area like some of the other teams. So I'd love to see them just throw a little bit more caution to the wind in, in that respect. I do think teams know their threat on the counter though and their kick strategy is to limit that. You know, a lot of contestable kicks in the backfield never, don't really give them that front foot ball um, and then, uh, you know, you, you know what it's like. There's no point wasting energy in that part of the field. So you have two or three goes. Uh, if there's a wall there, then you're probably going to utilise the backfield. So uh, there is an element of what, um, you know, other teams bring to them. But if we use the Hurricanes game as an example, I thought that, I, I agree with you, I thought that was the best game by Caleb. Like, he was really active in that game. Mark Talao was mm -hmm. huge. Rico was huge. Um, I thought Bryce Heem was, man, he was, he is just such a critical cog for them going into these finals. So if they use that as their blueprint, especially on attack, uh, that was the best and most free and in, ba in pretty tough conditions. Um, and, and they really executed that night because of exactly what Joe is saying, their, their threats were utilised. One criticism that I, when I spoke to Leon and oh, it, was, it was a while back was just around the strike, oh, the strike calls. He feels sometimes that when, he, when I mention about their game and why are we seeing some, you know, the, that I suppose the razzle and, and a little bit more flair from, you know, the athletes that you got. He, he said he sometimes his criticism of Bowden, he's a little bit cautious in his um, starter plays and his, uh, from, from set piece. And he, he'd like to see him throw a little bit more, I don't know, be a bit more adventurous in what he calls. Would that be a fair sort of, um, maybe criticism or, or critique of what the, the Blues have been doing, mate? I, I want to see him play like he did against the Reds, man. He really engaged defenders and created holes. You know, you think Wasn't about good, Cam, that game, yeah. Cam Suifua running off his shoulder, you know, you, um, get guys like Paddy in that into big holes, those big bodies running off him. And then just as we saw, because he's so fast, he gets through the other side and has his offload game or he goes through himself. I, I just would love... Um, that mindset of run first, almost, you know, just look at, you know, focus on himself early. And then defences just are so scared of that, that they'll start jamming in. And he's got the skill set and ability to whip that pass off his hip um, pretty quickly to, go, you know, big players running into holes, which 
um, you know, is, is certainly exciting. I do find it weird that we're having a conversation about Bowden Barrett being risk averse because there was a time where he was the exact opposite, right? Like he was way too cavalier. Well, I, I, I thought that as well. When Leon said it, I, I sort of went, well, really? Risk averse? He thought quite safe in his, in his calling. So oh, I agree. I, in, there's no better player when he's playing flat on the line like he is because far out he can, he can burn you on the outside, step you on the inside. Um, yeah, and that death little short kicking game that he's got as well up his sleeve is um, when he's on, he is deadly. Before we finish this show, I think it's a really good idea for us to just pay a little bit of homage to Moana Pacifica, who have had a terrible year. And then they went away, they picked up a 33-24 win in Sydney that I don't think anyone saw coming, and got that win to make sure they didn't get what could arguably be called the worst year in the history of Super Rugby. So, Joey, that was gutsy. Yeah, to finish this season on a high like that and send Aaron Major um, off with a, with a win rather than a big donut for the whole season. Um, yeah, they, they can be really proud of that effort. And it certainly was their best performance of the of the year. So save the best to last. Um, yeah, but I, I think as a whole, they'll still be really, really disappointed because I don't know, have they taken any steps forward? I'm not convinced. I'll, I'll disagree with you, Joey. <laughs> I think their set piece um, has increased. Like they were, you know, sort of high 60s. They're now um, in the 80s, which is a big step in the right direction. Um, and if you look at both Fiji and the Royal games, that's two games, close losses. The Blues game, close loss. Yes, I understand it takes um, an ability um, to win games and, and sometimes, you know, it almost felt like it was against it. The Rebels was another one, um, you know, and... Uh, you know, obviously you count the Waratahs, they're up around that the, that six win mark if they get across the line there. Um, and, you know, they're, they're up there with um, the Fijian Thrill. Yes, they didn't get it done, but there's, to me, they were in games a lot more than they were the year prior. Mm. But not winning them. Not not winning, but <laughs> closer to w than winning them. Uh, yeah. You're asking, is there improvement? I think there yeah, is. Yeah, there's improvement, but... Yeah, I, but, yeah, I think you said about these set pieces, I, I think these set pieces went... Is worse this year. Like their scrum is horrible. Like the amount of penalties that they get, they just get smoked every time. Especially against New Zealand sides. Like that's they just go backwards. They're rated right knots, mate. Like if they can shore that up, yeah. Well, but I mean, you know, hopefully they can keep their athletes. That's the other concerning part. Is are they going to be obviously Levi Amua, who's been their best this year? He's buggering off down south to the to the Crusaders. Are they going to be able to keep Timothy Tapa Tapa Nawai? Hopefully. Um, Christian Leliofano, what's he doing? The, this all that experience that they brought in, I just it, it's concerning to me that you know for continuity of their of that game to keep going. I just and obviously the coach leaving as well. It's it's a concern, man. Um, I, am I hearing two different things? So you're saying that they're really good on their own ball on set piece, and you're saying that they're atrocious on the opposition ball, and that's where they get penalised. I is think that what we're, we're differing here? between a scrum and line out as well. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. and I think it's recency bias. Like yeah. they weren't like that at the start of the season, personally. Like yeah. if you look at it. Yeah. So I'm looking at. I'm saying from the season as a whole, there is improvement at their set piece. Now, one of the things that I watched that game when I was watching the Moana Pacifica game that I thought was really cool was obviously Tapa Tapa Nawa. You mentioned him before. He's been a star this year. He just pops up everywhere. He just has a game now, an ability to be in the right place at the right time and score points from all sorts of weird and wonderful places. It made me think, who are the players that we wish were in the playoffs that aren't there that we'd like to see a little more of? So essentially, who are the MVPs of the bottom four this year? Chip, do you want to kick us off? Who are the two guys that you would like to see in the playoffs who aren't there? Billy Harmon. Jeez, I've loved watching him. He, yeah. he is very good. Oh, there's a couple of the Hollanders, to be honest, but he, he definitely sticks out. I think Sam Gilbert's another one. I think he, this was the coming of age of um, Sam Gilbert this season, and he's going to be better for it. Levi Moore, you can't go past Levi. He is a highlights package um, on his own. Um, so, yeah, I mean, those guys for me have, have piqued my interest this season. And for you, Joey? Yeah, I liked um, the fact that you mentioned the Kawhi Wangs boys. Yeah, Billy Harmon was an obvious one for me. Ethan DeGroote, I think, um, stamped his mark again this year. Super impressive. Him and I'll, I'll mention Tyrell Lomax as well. You can see why the All Blacks are, are heading in that direction. It's not only their scrummaging and set piece ability, but also they're popping up with ball in hand a lot. And their skill set is what's setting them apart. And I think. 
um, you know, he's been criticised around his work rate, but I thought um, Ethan's work rate this year was exceptional. Um, Jonah, Jonah Nardiki, um for the for the Islanders, I know he had been injured the majority of the season, but when he came back, you just saw how influential and how um, how much of a difference he makes to the to the Hollanders game. So I always love watching Jonah because he's just so heavily involved, um, always bringing something to the party. And the two guys from Moana Pacifica, um, obviously Jim the Bruss, as we call him in Tasman, all the difference. Um, yeah, he, he is a, a wrecking machine. Eh? He just he might not have the most top, but highest top end speed, but who cares when you're shrugging off about 20, 28 defenders per game? Um, and Levi Miller, obviously, his performances speak for himself. He was just exceptional every game he played this year, fronted up, um, which would have been a really challenging season, you know. When, yeah, it takes you to the last game, 13 games before that, um, getting not getting any chocolates. Um, those two guys always fronted. So, yeah, I think. If I was going to highlight two, it would be Billy Harmon and Levi Moore that I'd love to see um, in the final series. I'm glad he went two because I thought you were going to name the entire starting 15 of the Highlanders <laughs> for a moment. Hey, hang on, mate. Did you have a name more than me? <laughs> no, I don't name two. And now I'm just thinking just with our Aussie viewers, we better chuck uh, Carter Gordon in there. Yeah, he, he had a massive good. season. Um, and I thought Reese Hodge came back into his own um, as well. There's, you know, their, their loose forward trio, uh, Wilkin, obviously getting acknowledged in the Wallabies. Um, so yeah, the, the, the Rebels. Yeah, I, I reckon the Rebels had a had a had a solid year. It was just injuries at, at the wrong times didn't really allow them to kick on and, and take take advantage of that. Absolutely. Now three more weeks left in our tipping comp. Super oh, rugby geez, was tipping. Go there, check us out. You'll see across the bottom here where to go to check out that scoreboard. So three weeks to go. The winner, after three weeks, will come onto the show and we'll hear all of their hot takes. It should be a bit of fun. So, I, I think Bryn's missed a couple because he's really dropped in the ranks. <laughs> yeah, I've done the same. I don't know, just keep on forgetting to talk I just keep, I just got them wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I've got no excuse. It actually has been harder through the second part of the season um, getting some of these right. So rather than getting you to pick who's going to win this weekend, because I think we know who you're going to pick, I'd like to see a margin. Um, so Blues v Tars. Like 13 plus margin, or do you want to guess like, uh, like no, an actual margin? No, an actual margin, yeah. Uh, blues by 22. Blues by 22, that's a good win. I agree, I'd go Blues by 25. 25, even bigger. That's music to you, yes? Mm, mm. Excellent. Uh, Joey, Chiefs v Reds, what's your margin there? <laughs> uh, Chiefs by plenty. Um, oh. Man, 30? Do I go there? Yeah. Bugger it. Chiefs by 30. Bugger Chiefs by what? Them. Chiefs by whatever the weather 30. allows. Yeah. Yeah, I think that'll be interesting, the weather, but um, yeah, I'm with Joey. There's just too many injuries in, in the Reds. I'll say 31. Yes. Okay. Crusaders versus the Drua. Uh, Crusaders by 20. 20? Yep. That's a good one. Joey? I'll go slightly less. I, I want me to do a bit better than that. So I'll just go, I'll go 15. Crusaders by 15. Okay. And right, the last one, Joey. Brumbies v Canes. This is the 50-50 yeah. one, isn't it? Yeah, but I, I think the Canes are going to um, have a field day over there. So I'm going to go Canes by 14. Two Ooh. tries. Oh, yes. I was going to say that. Oh, yeah. I'm going Canes by, by, two tries. by 15. Right. So we're, we're all New Zealand semifinals. Yep. Good times, good times. <laughs> OK, well, tune in this weekend. It's going to be a few good games to enjoy, particularly that Brumbies-Canes game. Super Rugby's heading up quarterfinal time. Catch us again soon at Aotearoa Rugby Pod. James Parsons, thank you very, very much. And thank you very much, Joey Wheeler, for coming in from the Deep South. Appreciate your time, Thanks, especially, mate. you know, with it being a tough conversation about your beloved team at the very start there. Yeah, weren't there some daggers in there, mate? Far out. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's, you know, our viewers are on the money. It's because they're you know? trying to even trying to X the Highlanders to go to Bay of Plenty, the Steelers. <laughs> oh, yeah.
Yeah, yeah, they're so nasty you would have thought I made them up, but I can tell you, <laughs> go onto YouTube, you'll see them there. You'll see them there, I'm not lying to you. <laughs> All righty, well, thank you very much for joining us once again on the Aotearoa Rugby Pod. Send us an email, Aotearoa Rugby Pod at sky.co.nz. Comment on the YouTube channel. We'll endeavour to answer as many of your questions as we can. We can't always get to all of them. But thank you very much for tuning in once again to the Aotearoa Rugby Pod. Matewa.